Thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm super happy to be here. Big fan of the project. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. So this is Rusty Rollers Radio. I'm your host, Gremlin BB, and we meet every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. Eastern time to talk with artists and creators in the Web3 space. And today we have a really, really awesome guest. We have Yuri Beats, who's just piano man extraordinaire and key player at Zora, which is a codeless uh platform for creators to mint nfts so we have lots of exciting stuff to talk about with you today thank you so much for coming on thanks so much for having me i was actually uh looking at a cut an early cut of Derek's show the park uh recently and got to see you in in valentine's studio chopping it up with that team about nfts and talking through the rusty roller project a little bit which is really cool to see oh yeah that was so much fun i'm so glad i was able to make it out for that it was a fun to jam with people in real life which is always a joy as you know to play music with other humans totally and then just to like meet everybody and talk about cool stuff so i'm so glad i got to do that how crazy is that room it's right? so crazy oh my gosh with like the carpet on the walls and the reverb chambers that they have is pretty sick <laughs> it's like a, a bowling alley like personified into a recording studio it's a really really great vibe yeah no i was like so thrilled with it and i'm used to recording out of my second bedroom so to like actually be in a studio that's all equipped and treated and stuff was just such a trip and so exciting and made me like really inspired to go work in a studio more often so going into yeah that that is always like a life-changing thing is like being in a man yeah i'm just thinking of every time i've just gotten to like sit in a studio and watch people work and especially like I think there was a time I, I buy all my VSTs now, like I'm above board, but there was a time when I was just starting out when like studio visits were the best. Cause the engineers would just hook you up with like the crazy cracked plugin suite. Oh yeah. And I remember getting like waves that way and getting like all these native instrument hacks and um, yeah, just coming up like really hard on VSTs from studio visits. For sure. Yeah, I know the like transition from buying your plugin or cracking your plugins to buying your plugins is a real one. Uh, yeah, like... yeah, I'm thankful I'm on the other side of the street, but I got a new computer and like the new Max like crashed everything. So yes, I've just I've been working on a four track tape recorder and I'm going to oh, stick cool. with that. Yeah. Oh, sick. What uh, kind of tape recorder is it? So when I was like 14, I got a Tascam. Um, it's the Tascam that has a it's a four track with a mixer on it. Okay. So the exact model number escapes me, but it um it has a six tracks mixer attached to a four track tape recorder, and it's it's my favorite machine. I'm on the third version of it in my life that I've had because the uh, <laughs> the tape part keeps breaking every once in a while, but they're relatively affordable to pick up, and um. I, I was doing a project recently for uh, Ricky Lake where I was recording some piano out of my computer and I stopped trusting my computer's latency compensation on the live audio in. And so I've been like kind of freaked out about recording live audio to computer and Ooh. I've been excited about using uh tape more so yeah that combined with like sound toys deciding to never work again um has really pushed me on a tape r.i.p sound toys they have such good plugins <laughs> i like them so much yeah no the whole mac update really threw everything for a loop i had to like upgrade all of my software and then i got the new mac too and it's just it's a whole thing it's a whole thing and like Downloading a Steam library from Spectrosonics takes like <laughs> two to three days. <laughs> like ah. these are these are time intensive things to to be fixed. Like I, I haven't even like touched the contact libraries, but that's gonna be a whole. Yeah, I've just been moving too fast. I need. I think for the like holiday break is when I'll 
um, try and fix everything because it's like full yeah. speed ahead until then. Yeah, no, it, once everything cools down to the holidays, it's like great time to do maintenance. I'm going to like go through all of my desktop stuff and like clear out all of my old files and stuff. So yeah. looking forward to that. But yeah, so let's give everybody a little bit of background as to who you are and what you do. What were you doing before you got into Web3? Um, so when I started talking to Web3 people, I was working at um, I was working at Universal Music Group, and I was overseeing the East Coast roster of e-commerce stores. So uh, re- all of Republic stores, including Taylor Swift store, all the Def Jam stores. Um, so I had been, my background is, is always been like music and e-commerce. And so like the e-commerce path starts with me working at a brand called Willie Chavaria and helping them get online. Um, going from there to work at Everlane, uh, worked at Everlane for four years doing D2C ops, um, came in as like a very entry level kind of customer service person and left, uh, running D2C operations, went from there to UMG and then, um, yeah, from there into web three, working with medallion, working at FWB and most recently working at Zora and helping launch, uh, impermanent digital monarchs, a cab, um, and a, a few other, uh, NFT projects. And then running in parallel of that constantly is, is me being a piano player, um, making rap beats, uh, you know, working with, um, a few different rap groups, getting, a a track with little Dicky that, that went platinum at some point. Um, yeah. and yeah, yeah. Those are like the weird two, uh, two strains of my professional life that intersect surprisingly nicely around NFTs. So go yes. No, it's really fun how like web three kind of just sucks everything together and you can kind of do all the disparate things you were doing before, but all in like a streamlined way. So I'm happy to hear that that's been your experience as well. Yeah. When I was 14, my first job was selling pogs and beanie babies which is like strangely analogous as well. I, I think about the pogs a lot. That's so funny. Yeah, no, you totally understood the like the nature of a bubble and <laughs> yeah, 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 prayers yeah. and stuff from a young age then with the beanie baby stuff. And I miss I miss my pogs. I wish I had them. I don't know yes. where they are. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, Mom, where did I put those? Yeah, exactly. So how did you get into Web3? What's kind of like your NFT origin story? Yeah, I was at UMG and I was really interested in NFTs as a concept. And I started reading Sherry Hugh and Water and Music's reports um, and getting really fascinated by just how kind of permissionless and experimental the space was. Um and then from there, a really close friend of mine, uh, this fella named Noah, who um, used to be in this group Chitty Bang and now does a bunch of um, production independently. He's always been like a very close comrade in music to me and his buddy Dexter uh, and Trevor were, were, are both, you know, pretty critical parts of FWB. So he set up a meeting with me and... Dexter, where Dexter was like, I would never in a million years work with UMG on an NFT, but you should go mint something on Zora. So I went and minted on Zora. Cooper picked it up for 75 FWB. And that was like a week before the roll hack. And uh, I got very involved in that community and um, still, still I'm pretty active in it. Um, but from there was also able to auction off a publishing royalty stream as an NFT that helped me, um, you know, move away from UMG as my job and was able to quit and then um, started working with my friend Glassface on his project in Permanent Digital. Uh, and then from there, um, very quickly became involved in, in more projects and uh, was the first hire at an outfit called Medallion um, that Derek Davies who used to manage uh, my buddy Noah and, and runs Neon Gold, the label um, works at. So it was a uh, a pretty quick 
um, introduction to a lot of things really fast. I was thinking about October of last year. And I think between like September and October of last year, I worked on three or four different NFT projects, like each one for two weeks and uh, it's a pretty crazy sprint. And I feel that same energy coming up in kind of like a different form right now, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, that was, that was kind of the onboarding. Beautiful. And it's great start. And Zora and FWB, like that's, you're set with that. Um, so talk a little bit about what Zora is and why you are so excited about it and so willing to like put so much time into working on the platform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm super grateful to be involved with Zora. Zora is fundamentally a protocol. Um, and if, if, the definition of a protocol feels a little murky or a little ambitious. Um, Jacob Horn's essay on hyperstructures, I think is a really great way to sort of start digging into how Zora is, is thinking about that. And, uh, you know, that essay points to Uniswap as like this sort of public good that lives on chain um, and is autonomous and, and, you know, kind of community control and leveraged, which is a really, really interesting um, way to think about public goods. And I think there's a lot of unbounded optimism about sort of what public goods funding could look like in Web3, but there's enough like real examples of some of this stuff going on that I think um, it's it's worthy of attention. And so, you know, I think at different times, Zora sort of means different things. When I entered the space, uh, it was it was this marketplace where you could mint. And I remember going to the website and seeing a T-shirt and being confused about where the NFTs were and like hitting up Zora on Twitter and being like, yo, I went to the site and I'm only seeing clothing and like this something from RAC, like maybe selling a tape. I don't really understand what's going on. Like, when can I mint an NFT here? And they were like, oh, just give us like a week and, and you know, we'll, we'll have this public facing minting functionality. Um, so for a while, it was just like the ability to mint, um, the functionality of a secondary marketplace that is fundamentally without fees. And then over time, I think Zora has seen the needs of the space evolve. And now um, our main surface areas are create which is create.zora.co and nans builder nans.build which are two more primary oriented tools that um, create is for additions and now more recently for drops which is really exciting um, applications for this creator facing tool that allows you to mint um, collections whether they be from the same piece of media or multiple pieces of media uh, the latter being a relatively new introduction um, and then nouns.build is this idea of a, a fork of the nouns contract that can be easily deployed without code, um, allowing communities to spin up a treasury that is community controlled by holders of an NFT that is deployed uh, through or distributed through an auction that happens at a time cadence. And, you know, the time cadence for me is a really interesting solve for a lot of the issues in the space around um, some of the shortfalls of the, of the last cycle. A lot of what nouns builder is doing is, is a direct response to PFPs and um, some of the, um, you know, weaknesses of those communities and trying to rethink how we can build architecture that leads to more sustainable, more interesting um, and more equitable usage of communities and funds and identities and nfts definitely so talk a little bit about because when i went to the zora website and kind of read through the about uh a big part of that was the manifesto and the importance of nfts for creators to take back kind of their ability to distribute and also recoup things from the stuff that they put out into the world can you like elaborate a little bit on that and the importance of zora as a tool for creators yeah absolutely um thanks for saying that as well like i think um there's some guiding principles that sort of underwrite zora's direction that might not be immediately apparent 
as aligned with those values until you sort of get under the hood of what's happening in these platforms and in these environments and and how closed or open they are, how open source they are, how on chain they are. Um, A lot of the debate that we're seeing right now around secondary royalties is primarily an outgrowth of the secondary, the largest secondary NFT market um, being fundamentally a closed system that it struggles to honor the royalty standard as it exists. I mean, just straight up doesn't honor the royalty standard um, as it exists. And this is like a sort of an architectural outgrowth of how that platform is built and um, how opaque it is. And so Zora is, is sort of like built in specifically to move in the, in the opposite direction. Um, it's no code enough that you, that most creators can deploy their own contracts through what we offer, but it's on chain enough um, that it is, is really transparent system. Um, we open source pretty much everything that we build. And, uh, these are our pretty core principles, um, to, to what we're doing. So in terms of like how that this intersects with the manifesto, um, I mean, you know, the marketplace is feeless. Um, creator does have a 5% fee built into it, but that's something we're kind of talking around and thinking about how to turn over to the community. And then, um, yeah, I mean, the idea here is that, you know, when we roll out tools, we roll them out to everybody. We don't have like this kind of tiered system of access that you might see on other platforms. We try to be extremely open with how we construct the system. So it's as permissionless and uh, interoperable as possible. And yeah, that's kind of the, the vibe that Zora is rolling with. And then like in a less, um, you know, technical way, like just so many people who work at Zora are also creative people who bring their experiences in trad industries um, to the table and how we think about this stuff and how it should be designed. And um, that's a pretty incredible asset. Uh, there's just so many artists, musicians, uh, community folks that I admire who who work at Zora, and it's a yeah, it's a real joy to be working with them. That's so awesome. Yeah, no, it's great to like have a position where your coworkers and the people that you work with are also really cool people because I feel like that's how the really good ideas start to happen and uh, go out into the world. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a pretty unique experience for me, especially coming from like, you know, like the largest record label in the world where um, there, there can often feel like a lot of distance between the, the customer facing values and the sort of internal company culture. So, yeah, it's uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work there. Definitely. And I want to get into that more. But first, I want to ask you, um, as a creator yourself, what has it been like to have a no code tool to put your stuff out into the world? How has that ha- experience been like? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's fun, man. Uh, that's really like at the end of the day. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been trying to make top 40 rap songs for years. I've been scoring commercials for years. I've had a long run scoring fashion shows. Like I've basically tried to work my instrumental output into every component of the traditional music industry that I can find footing in. So, you know, the, uh, the commercial sync resume is pretty robust. Um, the rap placement resume is decent. Um, so, you know, in those systems, like I've started to realize that, putting your energy into the actual work, like the actual musical output, isn't always the most effective way to spend your time. Um, And even in systems like writing to briefs and writing for commercial demos, like there are all these nuances of how you interact with a creative agency that become pretty formative in terms of your ability to be successful. And so like there's all just, just very out of whack in sense of alignment. Um, and it really, you know, there are a lot of really creative people making incredible rap beats right now, but I think there are a lot of sort of components of that process that don't actually 
um, nurture new ideas or nurture creative thinking. And I think, you know, there's like a lot uh, that could be said around how drums need to sound right now to be on the radio. That is like, doesn't give a lot of space for you to have new ideas and innovate with how drums should sound. And a lot of that's just a product of, of budgets being smaller than they've been historically. And so margins are tighter and the appetite for risk is at an all time low, I think in music. So I started to accumulate like all these rules that I was working in, like the drums have to hit like this and like the mix has to be like this. And, you know, you can't, you should only use this kind of stuff. And I, I shouldn't be playing like live instruments. I should be playing synths like or VSTs and all these kind of rules, like sort of stacked up over time until I really felt, distant from the values that had gotten me into creating music to begin with which are like really about finding tools to navigate in inner life and to express yourself creatively and to be more alive in the world and you know you just don't feel that way when you're like making um a, a beat for chipotle's instagram which is a real thing um so i felt a lot of this kind of painting myself into a corner when I started to work with NFTs. And I, I, I started off realizing that there would need to be a visual component because discovery through a computer is such a visual process. And so like, I, I just reformed the aim. The aim was no longer to appeal to a creative agency. The aim was not to appeal to an a &R. The aim was not to sound like what was going on in the radio. It was just sort of like to sincerely explore visuals, their relationships to sound. I really gave up on meter and started expressing myself a lot more um, formlessly, like just Im improvising more, playing with texture more. And it really like I just felt more alive from creating in this way that wasn't um about a, a, a set of rules and all of this is an outgrowth of realizing that someone would be willing to give me the budget of a small <laughs> you know commercial to hold on to one of the pieces i was experimenting with with visuals and sound and so as soon as i realized that i like stopped taking commercial work um and i started just outputting nfts really kind of believing that it was an opportunity to create a new format that touched both visual and audio. And that's still like a process I'm engaged with wanting to really push forward. But I think just in different cycles of the market, the amount of like day job stuff I get really passionate about um, just ebbs and flows. And so my capacity to like, really lean into music goes up and down, but I'm feeling a lot of really good energy around the next couple months with music and I'm excited to lean back into it. But all of this is to say that, um, you know, some people might look at the distribution of NFTs and be like, this isn't that new, this isn't that novel, Bandcamp does this, or, you know, just all these kind of, um, they might not necessarily see how the format and how the financial rails of the medium impact people's appetite to uh, create in new ways. And to me, it was like, it was just a sea change um, of being able to monetize abstract concepts, being able to put things into the world and, and feel ownership of them and also be able to share them. It, it reminded me a lot of early SoundCloud. It reminded me of the blog days. It reminded me of the sort of boundless possibility that the internet should hold for creatives that I think, you know, a lot of these other platforms like Spotify just simply do not hold. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's really like revitalized my creative spirit. And honestly, um, in this time period, I've also moved from New York to Philly. I got a piano again. I've sort of hacked my way into um, playing piano at all these different weekly functions. And it's, it's a very selfish thing. Like I'm trying, I'm very bad at practicing, but if I play piano for like a meeting that happens every week, then I know, 
you know, like at Fridays at this time, I'm going to play piano. And that's been my, my way to get back in touch with the roots of it. And, um, I'm just, I'm really feeling like I'm entering, uh, uh, the stage of creating that I've been excited about since I was 14. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm rebuying all the same equipment. Like I'm, I'm getting the four track. I got the SP 404 sampler. Like I'm literally rebuilding my workflow as a teenager. Now as an adult with the kind of like context tools and experience to do it in a way that I can feel a little more confident about. So it's been a, it's been a pretty incredible journey. And, um, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not like the upside of that is really the the kind of thing that has been most formative, although that has been like a factor in just freeing up time and energy. But it's more about the sense of possibility here is, is something that inspires me constantly. And instead of bringing your work to market being this sort of like soul crushing experience of people at a creative agency telling you to sound more like death grips, it's been like this really just joyous celebration of people excited that we're creating in this space. And that attitude shift is like really, really felt. Um, and it shows up in everyone doing this work and everyone around this, you know, there's a, uh, there are moments when the, the cycle is so out of control that it can just feel like pure chaos mode. But I think the majority of the time, um, the people showing up day in, day out and doing this work, are really invested in realigning incentives to give artists and musicians the runway to do their best work. And, you know, anyone who's gone through a scene or been through a creative agency grind or been on any kind of come up with any of these has seen um, the kind of human cost of how some of these systems have worked historically. And so finding a way out of that um, and even reversing that trend is feels like there's there's nothing I'd, I'd rather uh, be putting my energy towards, even if I'm just a small part of a larger trend. Definitely. And that's so inspiring. Like, I love hearing these stories in Web3 of like people saying, oh, I used to create in this way and I kind of gave up on that. But like now that I've discovered Web3 and NFTs, I'm re-inspired again and like going back to things that I'd given up previously. So I'm so psyched to hear that this has had a positive impact on your creative process. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's really been a, you know, I think, I think, it's, it's always like moving towards or moving away from that. And um, yeah, Web3 feels to sort of like settle that balancing act in my mind that there's, there will be space uh, for this work on chain and that that's enough to make me feel really good about making it. Definitely. Uh, one thing that you hear a lot in the space is like, it's not about the gains, it's about the friends you make along the way. But something that I found is like a smaller creator is that uh, Web3 has a very, very engaged audience who are very open minded and like willing to listen to stuff, which is something that you don't necessarily find on traditional platforms like Instagram or even like Web2 Twitter, where people kind of just tune things out if it doesn't make it through their filter. Uh, has that been something you found in being in the space? Yeah, that's, I mean, I think one thing that is, is sort of in that vein is the feedback loop between audience and creator can get really tight to the point where you're almost like co-creating. Um, and to me, that's a really exciting gap to be closing, to be working alongside people and like, being able to talk to them about what works and doesn't work. And I think um, like, you know, that's definitely something that is sort of my role at a platform is trying to align the people using it with the people making it so we can both be leveraging um, our energy in the, in the same direction. And I think that's like, it's something platforms want, it's something creators want. So, um, and it's, it's shockingly something we're in a position to do better than most traditional outlets. So yeah, totally. Super cool. Uh, something that gets thrown around <clears throat> a lot in Web3 is like, oh, music NFTs and like uh, disrupting the original music industry and music NFTs are up next. Uh, where do you kind of see uh, the stage of music in Web3 and like 
what do you think is really positive about it and what do you see room for improvement with? Yeah, I mean, um, I think often uh, music NFTs or Web3 broadly is kind of like used as a, a, a fix-all remedy to the issues with the music industry, which I just don't think... I don't I, I don't think it's it fixes every issue and I don't think it's right for every use case. And I think like, you know, like Web3 would really struggle to produce an artist on the scale of like a Taylor Swift. Um, I think that's always going to be something uh, that labels do better. They're extremely well tuned um, to support the biggest artists in the world. What they do really poorly is. Um, help everyone else make a living. And so it's that's like the space where Web3 has the most opportunity. And I think it's that's the ground that we cover really, really well. Um, as far as like, you know, the, the infrastructure required for um, someone at, at the top of the industry, like Spotify is still making the money. They're getting paid millions of dollars per show. Like, all, all those folks are fine with the way things work. And honestly, like the music industry is really built for that exact use case and does not serve anyone who is not at the top of the game particularly well. And so, you know, it, it's it's uh, if you look at the, you know, sort of the the pie charts of label revenue based on on artists like, you know, this is something I got to see at UMG of like well, how much money are we making just from Taylor Swift? And it's like more than 50% of that pie is just Taylor Swift merch of like all UMG merch, right? And if you add Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, The Weeknd and Kid Cudi into that pie, then you're like at 90%, 95%, right? And that's like five artists. And you think about how many people are on every roster of every label that sits under this umbrella, um, and that's just totally crazy to think about. Like, it's not a sustainable model. They're operating at a loss on a lot of the artists that they're signing because very, very rarely a few artists will break through and make an insane amount of money. And that's just not like a very well, well optimized machine, like objectively. So, you know, there are a lot of people in the world who want to create art and express themselves and don't want to be a, a public facing brand and i think we have an increasingly difficult time finding a home for ourselves in this industry so web3 is has really stepped in and i think provided some surface area for people to release work and connect with others and tighten some of these feedback loops and you know i do think it's going to take longer than most web3 optimists probably would say to see um work that is really moving the needle on culture come out of this ecosystem but that's okay and that's like maybe for the best and every once in a while something will 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 break through and and make an impact and you know i think as time goes on that's going to be less about pictures of animals with adjectives and alliterative naming and more about uh work of substance so you know fingers crossed on that one Definitely fingers crossed. Um, something I've seen is that big labels, specifically Warner, are trying to get into the Web3 space. What are kind of your thoughts on that in terms of like impacting kind of the indie nature of Web3? Do you think of that as a positive thing or are you kind of like, just stay out of it, please? We don't want you. I think, um, I think we deserve to be really confident about how this space is built to, to not have to like really worry about it. I think, um, you know, big labels like often look really goofy when they step into web three. And I think that's by design. And like, I think it's fine if um, they want to experiment and start to learn the technology, but there's really no question that the better you understand like what is actually built here, the better you're going to be able to integrate with that and leverage that around what you're making. And we're just like not at a stage where a label is going to see tremendous upside from utilizing these tools. Like I just don't see it. 
Um, and I do think that it's it, it I I don't think it's a concern that we need to be like allowing to influence our trajectory as smaller creators and platforms in this space. One question I do think about a lot is for an emerging artist who's experimenting with Web3, are they looking to graduate to like a major label relationship or are they looking to have a career like exclusively within Web3? And I think that's a that's a question they don't nobody really needs to answer until they're forced with it. I don't think anyone should be limiting themselves or limiting their output. I think the incentive alignment that makes this space strong is that it encourages imagination, creativity, newness, you know, like I just I the thing I see a lot is people anticipating the power of labels being exerted on this space and allowing that to influence the choices they make about their output. And I would just hope that we don't internalize some of the dynamics that we're running from um, and that we really do look at this new surface area as an opportunity to um connect with each other and look into ourselves about the values we really want to see thriving here. And if, if we can do that, then there's no doubt in my mind that labels will have to um, accept that as part of this package. And I do think that there's a lot about these systems that they don't understand. Like, I guess the, the best way to say it is like even getting into this, the conceptual framework that was required of me in my head to understand why decentralized, permissionless, trustless, interoperable tools were meaningful was so profound that I'm not like worried that Warner is going to figure that out and start building to that. Right. Like it's just, it's conceptually challenging enough that like I sit down with my dad like every couple of weeks and try to explain it to him. And he like has, every time I have to repeat myself about what's going on. Like, I'm just not worried that this code is going to be cracked by institutional actors who are also having to hold in their head the mechanics of how Web2 operates, right? Like, they're, they're looking to, like, really max out uh, album sales for first week charting performance. That's, like, a mindset that you really have to commit to to win at. And like, you can't do that and also be like, wow, like we got to figure out how to, you know, exit this treasury to community so we can have the best governance protocol. Like these are just like so profoundly oppositional that the people committed to the latter over the former are going to be the people doing exceptional work around the latter. Right. So it's just, I, I, I understand that like the industry is scary and um, power generally should be, viewed with skepticism i mean these are all things that i subscribe to but i just like they're making so much money on like 10 artists that i just wouldn't really worry about how they conceive of web3 and i also wouldn't anybody watching how this is built will know that it's built to be really really durable so i think there are like people are bracing for conflicts in a way that is ultimately unproductive. Um, and I think that web three is much stronger at the protocol and platform level than people give it credit for. There, there are plenty of actors and closed systems in this space that may have a hard time if labels move in a certain direction. But I think that people who are building with like, deep understanding of, of the advantages of being on chain are also building a very, very durable system that um, knows how to protect itself. For sure. That's really inspiring stuff. Um, I'm curious what the spiel that you give your dad is when you're explaining what <laughs> stuff to him. <laughs> we were just like going through the, the like open sea royalty thing this Friday and he was like, Man, they really messed it up when they didn't uh, honor that uh, EIP 2189. And I was like, yeah, man, like that is it. And they can't honor it because they're a closed system. And he was like, huh, that's a, uh, uh, uh. he's a, he's a visual artist. So I'm like, he's never had, like, he's always been fully committed to a sculpture and visual art practice his whole life and has never like, he's just kind of a disagreeable human being. So has never been in a position to monetize his work effectively. Like just doesn't have a, uh, 
the kind of patience or business sense that I think is required to sort of be a brand and an artist. He actually views those things as like pretty oppositional. And so, you know, the idea that there's like a clean solution to get his work to a market um, is really exciting for him. But I think there's just a lot of skepticism that needs to be addressed. And then, uh, and then we always get to the part of the conversation where he's like, all right, if, if web three is so great, why does everybody pay all this money for the pictures of the monkeys? And I'm like, Oh man, here you go. Like, and he's not wrong, but I also think that's a growing pain, right? Like if you look at the early internet, there were a lot of like cats playing the keyboard. There was a lot of babies dancing. There was a lot of very like lowbrow, uninspiring stuff going down. And that's just people experimenting with the medium in goofy ways. And, uh, you know, the financial rails that make those extremely expensive assets are a little frightening and have pushed the space in a direction that I think people are rightly skeptical of. But I think time will, you know, it's easy to like think of everything that's happened in the last year as the entire story here. But I think with a little more time, um, our perspective on some of these giant revenue spikes will become a little more grounded. And we'll view them as more like anomalous than a, a pure definition of the space. Definitely. Um, so if you were to talk to a young person who is just starting to, or getting started with their musical career, like they have a couple mu uh, songs together, they have an idea of what they want to accomplish musically, but they're starting to put their stuff out into the world and build an audience. What sort of advice would you give them and how would Web3 factor into that advice? I think the most important thing any artist can do is build a team. Um, web three, web two, web four, web five, having people around you that you can talk to, that you can trust and that you can grow with is always the most important thing. Um, there, you know, they're like, especially in music, there's, there's always a large team of people standing behind any success that looks like it's a single actor. So, um, having a, a small tight knit community of people who are curious about what you're curious, who can be critical with you about the tools you're using. I think this is the key to staying grounded. The last thing you want to do is isolate yourself from the world at large uh, and, and not have that feedback on what's happening in this very particular corner of the internet. So uh, building a team is going to be, you know, valuable no matter what your go-to-market strategy is. Um, and, and making good work is going to be valuable no matter what your distribution plan is. So I, I really do believe like just really, really trying to put it all in the work and trying to get extremely good at your tools. You know, I think there are a handful of musicians that you can point to who like really, really got to know a piece of equipment better than anyone. And that is a large part of what made them be capable of killing the game. So as... Whereas, like, you know, sometimes you look at these technically incredible people and think, oh, they're just like, there's some sort of magic happening here. What you're really seeing is someone like honing in a craft with a piece of equipment at a very, very high level. Like, you know, I'll watch like the Fred again boiler room set and be like, wow, that person got to know that particular machine controller incredibly, incredibly well. And that like sets the table for them to do all this incredible stuff. Um, even like producers, like, you know, like, like an OPN, I'm just like, Oh, that person got to know like the spectrosonic suite of <laughs> synths like incredibly well, you know, and it really shows. So being incredibly good at one piece of hardware is a huge deal. Um, and I think everyone should have, that thing that they can pull out and be like, oh, you don't take me seriously? Cool. This is me doing this on this instrument. And, or this is me doing this vocally, or this is me experimenting, you know, with lyrics in this way. Like anyone who really crushes it has that, that thing that they just do reps on, right? Where you're just like going to the gym of that tool every day. And that's how you're staying grounded in your craft. And, you know, for me, the most consistent thing along those lines has been the piano. 
but um, everyone I know who's really dedicated to music has that one thing. And it doesn't have to be a traditional analog instrument. It could be, you know, I'm going to get really into how my voice is processed. I'm going to get really into, you know, how I do ad libs. Like any great artist has these little spheres of excellence where you can tell they've just put an outsized amount of effort into dialing in that particular component. Um, so yeah, I think like that and people around you is the most important thing full stop. And then your go-to-market strategy is like where NFTs can be useful. Your branding community strategy can be where NFTs are useful. Your, you know, even your kind of like connecting and building that team can be where NFTs are useful. But the the basis of getting really, really good at a specific thing, I think that's the the bedrock of any kind of artistic practice. And even from that, you can like design outwardly, right? Like, okay, I'm going to do this every Friday. And then, well, you know, leading up to that, I'm going to listen to last Friday's, uh, you know, practice on Thursday. Oh, and leading up to that, like, I'm going to mix down the recording on Wednesday. And so you just like kind of like try to build out a life that puts music at the center. And, you know, if that's like go to a job and grind from nine to five, like that is what it is. You got to do what you got to do. And then, um, you know, try and give music as much real estate as you possibly can around that. Definitely. Uh, going back to the idea of the team thing, are there like particular players that you would recommend, like having a mixing engineer, having someone coordinate your, help you with your social media and stuff? Are there specific roles that you should look for as a musician? I mean, that's incredible if you're in a position to pick and choose like that. But to me, finding people you enjoy being around and who you can trust is like so much more important. And like literally one of them can learn like, you know, if you listen to like how Green Day started, right? It was like, well, we I just like hung out with my two closest friends and one of them learned the drums and one of them learned the bass. Like Talking Heads, same deal. Yola Tango, same deal. Like Pixies, same deal. Like, you know, you have time. If you're embarking on a sincere musical practice, you have decades. So actually being good at what you do is not the number one thing you should be vetting with the people you surround yourself with. People you can trust and people you care about and people who care about you and share your outlook on artistic practice are the most valuable things in this space. And um, you can find people like that better yet find a group of people like that. Like one of them will just learn how to be an engineer. Like seriously, like I, I mean, it's like hard to be an engineer, but it's not so hard that someone can't learn it in a few years. And even with like, rapping like when i was really grinding in like the underground scene of new york like there were rappers who were not good at rapping and then two years later we're good at rapping and i was just like oh it takes like two to three years like of really grinding on that to get good at that like i probably shouldn't have been so dismissive of that person when they sent me their demo and didn't sound great um so to me like you know depending on where people are like skill set is important but the, the amount of ground you can cover if you're surrounded by people you enjoy being around and it is so profound and it won't feel like work. It'll feel like um, joy. And, and that's the real gift of, uh, of caring about this stuff. That's really good advice. Thank you for saying that because I feel like that's something that people don't talk about a lot. Um, something I want to go back to is you mentioned briefly NFTs is an opportunity to combine the visual and the musical. And I feel like a lot of times in the internet, music gets lost because people don't stop long enough to listen. They just take in information visually more often. Mm -hmm. How do you see that like becoming kind of a new art form, this like audio visual combination? Yeah. I mean, well, what you're speaking to is fundamentally discovery of music being broken um, pretty much since I want, in my experience of it, and I imagine mileage may vary on this, but in my experience of music discovery, it's been broken since the end of the blog era. And blogs were a really beautiful tool for discovering music. Um, they were sufficiently decentralized that they felt unregulated. Um, and, you know, you would have these regional scenes that would bubble up into these different blogs that would aggregate into larger platforms that a &Rs were tapped into. And a lot of people like in New York in 2013 got signed off of 
really good music videos and being hot on blogs. And unfortunately, I think what came out of some of these um, experiences was sort of uh, exposing the misalignment between what resonated with people in these organic um, decentralized kind of media platforms with what functions well inside the music industry. So there's a pretty well-documented string of people who really killed it on blogs. And then sadly, like didn't really find major label success because the labels didn't know how to continue the sort of circumstances that led to their success. So in my mind, Krayshawn's like a textbook example of this. This is a incredibly talented creator who is deep in a scene making incredible work and then you know unfortunately got scooped up by the wrong label atlantic and was no longer in a position to make compelling work anymore because the factors that went into that gucci gucci video whether it speaks coming through or odd future rolling up or little debbie doing hair and makeup like all these really beautiful organic localized factors were removed from the equation and there's just a a long list of people from this era who weren't able to replicate the independent success they were able to generate in major label environments. Trinidad James, another example of an artist who should have crushed it when they got to a label, but didn't. But fortunately, and then I don't know how, how well this is known, but Songs Publishing actually had to buy all of Trinidad James's publishing for the usage of the phrase don't believe me, just watch in Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson. Um, and please forgive me, I forget the other gentleman's name on that song. But, you know, Trudy Dan James got a great pub deal out of being quoted in a Mark Ronson tune, which is a beautiful end to his story. But it doesn't change the fact that these, you know, machines are geared towards a very particular kind of success. And that success has a very specific character. And, uh, you know, it's it's personified by the people we see at the top of the charts. And it's relatively limited in terms of who can be successful, how they can be successful and what rules they can play by when they get successful. Definitely. Um, we've reached the philosophizing era or part of the interview. If you had access to any tool and had unlimited time and creative energy what sort of stuff would you create i would love to uh develop my voice if i had unlimited time um i would really put a lot of energy into be able being able to create a compelling vocal comp performance it's so profoundly emotive it's such a great tool for the transfer of emotional energy um i've always been extremely shy around how i use my voice and it's been difficult for me to bring it to bear in my practice which is you know really actually influenced how i play piano like when i play piano i really try to get a sound and an articulation out of the machine that sounds like vocalizing um but this is a poor substitute for the integrity of the human voice and the ability to mix sound and texture with words that carry so much resonance and meaning this is a very special thing and um i have sort of come to the position where i will be happiest in my artistic output supporting other people's vocalizations and that's a really content place for me to be but um you know even like even just in my own time like i've started singing along with myself when i play piano more and it has a really um deep effect on how i'm able to like kind of relate to whatever I'm processing in that, in that moment. So um, yeah, the human voice is incredible and there's such capacity for innovation around it. Like, I don't know if you've checked out Yeet, but like there's some incredible ways that vocals are being used in, in, in rap vocal performance by artists now that I think like are genuinely um, innovative and in pushing the medium forward. So, you know, whether that's Roddy Rich going, eh on a track or like whatever it is, I think the human voice um, is, is a secret sauce. And yeah, uh, that's, that's the thing I would love to with infinite time and energy uh, deeply articulate. Hell yeah. No, I love you. And I think that like rap is a really cool uh, place for a lot of exper more experimental sounds to come out. So I'm 
happy to hear you say that because that, that's what I'm looking for is like noise music coming into the world through rap. So hopefully that happens. Um, also, if anyone in the audience has any questions for Yuri, go ahead and request to speak and I'll bring you up. Um, next philosophizing question, uh, where would you like to see the NFT world or Web3 like five years from now? What sort of tooling would you like to see develop to help support creators? Wow. Time is so crazy in this space. Five years feels like just like, you know, the deep future. Um, in, in the more immediate future, like maybe in the next year, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can learn from, from the PFP boom. And I think a lot of those projects wanted to be DAOs in some capacity. Like you can see very community oriented impulses in that scene, but a sort of absence of architecture to bring that to bear. And, um, I would like to see the next blow up PFP project have a community controlled treasury, right? Where the holders of that project can make choices around the funds that the project generates. Um, you know, there's, there's simply like a profound misalignment of incentives here. And I think a lot of what people are trying to solve with royalties can actually be addressed um, through different kinds of action around primary markets, whether that's releasing work over time instead of all at once, or whether that's, um, you know, having the community be more tightly involved with co-creation than they have in the past. We've seen all these impulses, you know, kind of surface in this space, but we haven't seen the tooling develop alongside it to allow it to really thrive. And like, if you think about what a thin veil of utility allowed for the last bull run, you know, this idea that your digital identity is linked to this avatar picture, like, very little architecture actually happened around that. Like it happened before Twitter started integrating NFTs. And honestly, like Twitter's integration of NFTs is goofy to begin with. You know, like I, I think a lot of the real breakthrough connecting of dots are going to happen in um, these kind of less technologically uh, sophisticated ways and more in just like cognitive understandings of how we relate to digital objects. And, um, you know, the, the thing that really blows my mind about NFTs is they sort of take this undifferentiated stream of the internet and they provide edges to digital objects and assets within that stream, which allow for ownership, which allow for trading and arbitrage and allow for distinctness around something that was otherwise previously undifferentiated and a great analogy for this is if you think about time like before clocks there was a moment when time was an undifferentiated stream and like you could look up at the sun and you could gauge roughly what time of day it was and maybe people were better at that then than they are now but you still aren't talking about minutes and so then you have this consensus that kind of like grows up around what time is what hours are we all agree on how time should function and there's like a ton of innovation that allows us to leverage time more effectively than we would have previously allows us to possess time have time put time on our wrists so this kind of like and that's all like that's in part technological that's in part consensus based that's in part like just people kind of leveraging the technology that exists to think of these broad concepts in new ways. And I think like we're watching that happen in front of us with the internet extremely quickly. And uh, it's a really exciting time to be alive. I totally agree. I'm so glad that we are alive and doing this uh, when we are, because there's a lot of cool stuff happening. Uh, pitch your stuff. What are you working on currently that you want people to be aware of? I got this NFT edition of me eating chili out of a cup. Um, only five people have minted it. The rest of you are cowards. Um, so, yeah, you can eat chili out of a cup. Shout out Derek. Derek's in the audience. He minted two of those. Four if you count all the accounts he's minting from. So, respect. Um, and then I got two NFTs left on my uh, drop, Zorb's Travels. AI generated images and text of a Zorb traveling throughout history. So, you know, if you want to see the Zorb at Woodstock, you want to see the Zorb versus Godzilla. Um, yeah, these are all in my Twitter feed. 
but please by no means feel obligated. I mean, these are like predominantly free things. Like I'm not, I'm not expecting anybody to really put a lot of money down to hold an image of me eating chili on chain, but I do think it's worth the two to $3 you're going to burn in gas. So, you know, that image of me eating chili that looks like iced coffee could be with you forever. Um, so let's, let's just remember that. Um, and then, yo, check out uh, nouns.build. Incredible tool for building a DAO. Incredible uh, just functionality built into that one. Check out create.zor.co. Uh, we just added drops, which is different than additions in so much as it allows one contract to reference multiple pieces of media. Pretty crazy. I'm not expecting you all to go crazy on Zorb's travels, but if you want to see an example of what this looks like, you should click through on that. Um, this is just like a very exciting time. These very rough versions of these tools are being rolled out. They're being refined constantly and uh, stuff that it would take a contract and a multiple dev team to get accomplished a year ago. You can now get done in an afternoon. I think I made Zorb's travels like while lying down and watching something on Netflix. Um, just the, the tightness around co-creation that we're trying to generate with some of these tools is really exciting. And there's going to be some crazy stuff coming out of nonstop build. I mean, Purple Dow is already killing it. Um, on the treasury front, they're really doing some massive work there. There's a proposition, uh, Prop 167 in the Nouns ecosystem, if any of y'all are Nouns holders, to fund the Builder DAO uh, to the tune of 1,000 ETH. That one is alive and well, and uh, I'm very excited to see that wrap up tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. So, yeah, there's a lot going on in the ecosystem. Um, feel free to DM me if you ever have any issues with Zora tools. I'm thinking about it all the time. Um, but yeah, those are the things I'm hyped about. It's a lot to be hyped about. I gotta go find the you eating chili one now because I'm I'm intrigued. It's a quality NFT. Only five, you know, Derek's four of those mints. I'm just saying. Some more people can be mint. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> nah, that's I put that on my list for tonight. Sheesh. But, uh, <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It was really wonderful and I appreciate you and everything that you do. Uh, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to y'all for tuning in. Um, really appreciate all you, Bloomy, Derek, everybody coming through. Nice to see you here, and y'all have a lovely day. Woohoo! So, thanks everyone for tuning in. This is another edition. Wobbles, of- what up? What up, Wobbles? This is another edition of Rusty Rollers Radio, where we interview cool people doing things in the space. Uh, we have another awesome guest lined up for next week. Uh, so stay tuned for that announcement and we meet every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. So we'll see you next week. And until then, have a great week. Yeah.